Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me and uh, welcome to all of you. So Dr. Schauer has done a nice job of summarizing the remarkable anti-diabetic impact of gastric bypass, which typically causes full remission of diabetes type 2 in 80 to 85 percent of cases. The question from my perspective is why would that occur? What are the mechanisms? And the most obvious one is that when people lose a whole lot of weight, they get more insulin sensitive, as you would with any form of weight loss. And this is certainly true with gastric bypass. Insulin sensitivity has been shown to increase at all the relevant target tissues after the operation, and this is associated with a laundry list of intracellular changes in those tissues, all of which would be predicted to contribute to improved insulin sensitivity. The key feature about all the studies shown here in this list, though, is that they looked at people many months to years after their operation, and since they are expected changes from profound weight loss from any cause, they don't necessarily speak to anything beyond the effects of weight loss, uh, anything weight independent. But I want to admit from the start that I don't disagree with the notion that simple weight loss induced improvements in insulin sensitivity contribute to the impact of gastric bypass on diabetes, at the very least in consolidating the effects over the long term. The more interesting notion, though, that something special might be going on, something weight independent beyond the uh, expected effects, was first uh, thought of from the clinical observation that diabetes often melts away very quickly. And this is shown in a single patient here of Dr. Pori's is from many years ago who lost his diabetes over about a week after gastric bypass. This is not just an isolated case here from Dr. Schauer's study of 1,160 patients. Of those with diabetes, about a third of them went out of the hospital after their operation with no diabetes medicines on board and normal blood sugars at an average hospital stay of less than three days. So clearly, this is way before you can invoke body weight changes as a cause of diabetes remission. The second body of information that makes us think about something special and weight independent occurring after gastric bypass comes from a mounting and so far uncontested body of evidence showing that the glucose homeostasis improves better and more after gastric bypass induced weight loss than after equivalent weight loss from other means. And I'm just going to exemplify this with a beautiful study by Carl LaRue uh, in which 25 patients each with all with diabetes underwent either gastric bypass or gastric band. And in this case, they did an unusually good post-operative coaching job in the banding group and got equal weight loss over three years. So that's atypical, but it allows us then to compare the resolution of diabetes remission that rates with equivalent weight loss. The band group eventually saw remission of diabetes in about 25% of cases, but you can see it took a long time, whereas the bypass group saw impressive remission of diabetes to about 80%, and the most important thing was it, it was very, very fast. This despite very equivalent uh, weight trajectory curves. Similar data have been published also comparing bypass versus band with equivalent weight loss by Francois Patu, as well as equivalent studies by Laferrere in humans and Marais in animals comparing equivalent weight loss and its impact on diabetes with dietary weight loss versus gastric bypass. And then Dr. Lee et al. looked at a sleeve gastrectomy with or without a proximal intestinal bypass mimicking that of a gastric bypass and again found more profound improvement in the, uh, in the, the bypass version despite equal weight loss. So there's a mounting body of evidence that show that diabetes improves more after gastric bypass induced weight loss than with similar weight loss achieved either with purely restrictive operative procedures or with dieting. Third body of evidence that suggests there's something special going on is an inconsistent relationship between the amount of weight lost and the resolution of diabetes. And I'm just going to highlight this with a data from a study in which I'm involved in collaboration with Dr. Shashank Shah in India. We're interested in studying Indians with diabetes because this ethnic group is very susceptible to getting to diabetes at a very low BMI. As a consequence, India leads the world in total number of diabetics, even though it's not a very obese country in general. We've uh, recently published a study of the use of gastric bypass in patients with, with diabetes in India, BMI with 22 to 35. Uh, this is a, a group that, this is a range that would be deemed by the WHO Indian specific criteria to be either overweight or obese. They had type 2 diabetes confirmed with uh, antibody studies, very severe disease, average duration 9 years, 80% on insulin and A1C way out of control at 10.1, and other features of metabolic syndrome. <clears throat> Here are the results we recently published at 9 months and they're very consistent with follow-up data now out to a year and a half. They overall lost about 20% of their body weight. Hypertension and dyslipidemia improved, but I want to focus on glycemia. Remember, they had rip roaring diabetes at the outset with an average fasting glucose of 233 in the beginning, and this normalized beautifully fast over the course of the study. 
with 80% of people dropping all their diabetes medicines by the first month and 100% thereafter. Hemoglobin A1C tracked this, starting at an out-of-control 10.1 and normalizing over the course of the study with, again, everybody dropping their medicines. Bottom line, we uh, observed 100% diabetes remission by three months, most of them by one month, and all persisting throughout the study. The relevance of this study to the current bullet point I'm trying to make is that the total body weight loss in this group was about a fifth of body weight, whereas if you, what would, it, would be expected in the historical controls with this procedure done on more obese people would be about a third of body weight loss, a larger absolute and percentage body weight loss achieved with bigger people, body mass index over 35. And so with lesser weight loss in this lighter group, we still achieved at least as good or better diabetes remission, further speaking to the notion that weight loss is not the whole story. I'm just going to take this opportunity to announce by name that, that, that these data shown here uh, generated pilot data that allowed us to get funding for a randomized controlled trial of best medical care versus uh, rheumatoid gastric bypass in leaner Indian diabetics, the COSMID trial comparison of surgery versus medicines for Indian diabetes. And I just announced its name and we'll be getting started on that in May. Another study in which I'm involved in collaboration with Ricardo Cohen, again, looks at gastric bypass to treat type 2 diabetes in Caucasians with BMI 30 to 35, so-called class 1 obesity. This publication, uh, imminently to be submitted, uh, reports data on 66 patients, follow-up to three years, BMI 30 to 35, again, type 2 diabetes confirmed with antibody studies, and again, a very severe condition with eight years of duration, 60% on insulin, and an A1C average at the outset of 9.5. Here are the important data we observed in this three-year study an 88% full remission diabetes, defined here as A1C less than 6.5 off of medicines for diabetes. An additional 11% enjoyed improvement in their diabetes, and only a single patient didn't really see any change. The point I want to make, again, from my bullet point, is that when we tried to examine the difference between the people who enjoyed full remission versus those who only showed improvement, there was no difference at all in their, body, in their waist circumference curves shown here or in their body weight reduction curves. Again, bespeaking the notion that amount of body weight lost or central adiposity lost is not the whole story that dictates diabetes remission. The next point suggesting something special, something weight independent after gastric bypass and its effects on, on diabetes come from experimental operations that try to tease out the anti-diabetic impact of gastric bypass from its weight reducing. And I'll mention each of these in a moment. Duodenal jejunal bypass, endoluminal sleeve, and ileal interposition are all intestinal rearrangement operations that get much more improvement in, in glucose homeostasis than would be predicted for the amount of weight lost. And finally, there are insights from rare but illuminating cases of profound hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia that is sometimes seen in patients after gastric bypass, typically many years after the operation, suggesting that the, the operation confers a state in which, which improves beta cell function and or mass in a, in a progressive way and probably benefits most people, but sometimes goes too far, suggestive of a possible as yet undiscovered beta cell trophic factor. And uh, this would never happen with weight loss from any other means. So what could potentially cause weight-independent anti-diabetic mechanisms after gastric bypass? Changes in gut hormones have been alluded to. They're a natural candidate. The gut produces lots of hormones that impact on glucose homeostasis. I usually start by mentioning ghrelin, and it's not because I think it's the most important one anymore. It's because it was the one that got the, the conversation started and is the focus of much of my own work. Ghrelin is an appetite-stimulating hormone. We showed some years ago that it levels rise before each meal, consistent with the role in, in mealtime hunger, and that when you lose weight after, say, dieting in this, in this study, levels go up commensurate with the role in long-term body weight regulation. We also showed, however, that after gastric bypass, levels are profoundly lower in our hands, a finding that has been largely sub, uh, supported by most uh, authors in the literature, though there's been heterogeneity. But the weight of consensus suggests that there's some compromise, at least constraint, in ghrelin levels in the face of bypass-induced weight loss. What's that have to do with diabetes? I mentioned this is an appetite-stimulating hormone, but it has many impacts on glucoregulatory system, all of which are served to increase blood glucose. So ghrelin is pro-diabetic. Thus, any operation that, can, that compromises its secretions would be expected to contribute to an anti-diabetic effect. Another hypothesis that has more teeth to most people than the ghrelin hypothesis is the lower intestinal hypothesis. This is pretty straightforward. The idea is that 
surgical operations to create an uh, anatomic shortcut for ingested nutrients to get to the distal intestine should hyperstimulate L cells in that intestine sec to secrete their products, GLP-1, oxyntomodulin, and PYY, which contribute to improves in reductions in food intake and improvement in insulin sec secretion. After some muddy times in the literature on this, it's been now confirmed that postprandial elevations do occur in all L cell products. And the important one for our current conversation is GLP-1, a well-known anti-diabetic hormone. An important thing to think to realize about the increases in GLP-1 after gastric bypass is that this comes from the right place, poised to engage neural circuits through the vagus that are very important to the full impact of GLP-1 on diabetes and probably get you more mileage than an equivalent blood level increase would happen if you injected, say, by eta. Also, it has been shown by LaFerrera and company that this increase in GLP-1 is indeed associated with the predicted increase in the incretin effect on insulin secretion. Now the distal intestinal hypothesis would predict that if you could just surgically take a piece of ileum and transpose it up into the beginning of the intestine where it's going to be in contact with more nutrients, that should hyperstimulate L cell secretions and render anti-diabetic effects. And these studies have been uh, re rejuvenated by uh, April Strader and company, uh, also taken into humans by DePaolo and others. The operation in summary causes no gastric, no, no gastric restriction or malabsorption. It does hyperstimulate GLP-1 and PYY, and this is associated with improved glucose homeostasis that's out of proportion to the degree of weight loss after this procedure, which is not very big. And in animals, at least, it seems to be associated with a long-term increase in beta cell mass, possibly from the GLP-1. So based on that body of data, you might conceive the following simple model. I would conceive that uh, maybe this would be debated from the prior speaker, but gastric banding, primarily a, an anatomic procedure, causes weight loss, and with this over a long period of time is the expected produce reduction in insulin resistance. Gastric bypass, with its ability to reduce weight, would do the same over the long haul, but in addition have an early effect on incretins to increase insulin sensitivity. I would challenge though that that model is not the whole story, and this comes from observations uh, spearheaded by Francesco Rubino here at the podium, articulating the upper intestinal hypothesis. And his, uh, his studies were started by his invention of this, the duodenal jejunal bypass. It's a gastric sparing gastric bypass that involves the same intestinal bypass as a gastric bypass, but without compromising stomach volume. In his original studies in diabetic Goto Kakazaki rats, there was no change in food intake, no change in um, body weight compared to sham operated controls. And yet the diabetes shown here with an oral glucose tolerance test in those animals was largely remitted at one week after the operation and persisting to nine months, kind of the equivalent of 40 years in humans. After validating this in another animal model, uh, Rubino and Cohen et al. Uh, went on to show in the first two cases in humans that this applies also in that species. This is a couple of patients who have relatively high fasting blood glucose on diabetes medications, high insulins to generate that, and after undergoing duodenal jejunal bypass, rapidly and persistently normalized both glucose and insulin, as well as A1C values. The guy on insulin dropped his medicines at about three weeks. The one on oral medicines lost him within a couple days. The key thing here is that in both cases, there was no change at all in body mass index or body weight, so this has this operation has teased out the anti-diabetic impact of gastric bypass from its weight-reducing effect. This has been supported now by larger studies. I'll show you data from one uh, that I'm also involved in with Ricardo Cohen, engaging in the uh, duodenal jejunal bypass with the following limb links in human beings. This has been tested now on 46 patients, body mass index between 22 and 35. Again, severe diabetes confirmed as type 2 with antibody studies. 70% um, on insulin, mean A1C up to close to 9. And the key take-home finding was that these out-of-control diabetics relatively quickly and durably reduced their A1C values to within close to the normal range, and all of them were off of diabetes medications by the end of the study. Harkening back to my earlier point, there was no relationship at all in the, percent in the, in the change in body weight in hemoglobin A1C versus the change in body weight in this study. Again, reiterating the notion that body weight change is not the key feature in the anti-diabetic effect of this kind of proximal intestinal bypass. Theoretically, you could get the same thing by just creating a bypass through the duodenum with an intestinal sleeve, and this has been done. Here again is work from Francesco Rubino doing this in Gotokakizaki rats and showing a, 
a complete remission of their diabetes by the implantation of such a sleeve, which did not work in various important control groups. You the theoretically could then apply this to humans, and that's been done with GI Dynamics leading the charge. I show you data from their first 120 patients implanted with a duodenal sleeve, and at seven months they had an incredible 2.9% reduction in hemoglobin A1C. This is so, like from 9 to 6.1, above and, uh, way above the uh, reductions from the control group who were asked to exercise and diet. This was not because they lost weight. There was a little bit of weight loss in the sleeve group shown at the very end, but their improvement in fasting blood sugar shown here started at one week and persisted throughout the entire study long before weights diverged. Now, at this point, from what I've shown you, you don't know whether anti-diabetic impacts of intestinal bypass come from expedited delivery of nutrients to the distal intestine or from exclusion of nutrients from the upper intestine. And so Francesco uh, addressed this in a paper that he uh, was kind enough to let me work on him with and created this, uh, this operation shown on the left hand, right hand panel for you where the intestinal short circuit to the distal intestine is maintained, but now intestinal filling through the proximal intestine is restored. Here are the results again in diabetic rats. They start out diabetic. After the original duodenal jejunal bypass, their diabetes is largely resolved. But if we simply help connect the, intestine, the nutrient circulation through the proximal intestine, it completely sabotages the diabetic impact. And then in some heroic surgeries, he took animals from one state to the other, or vice versa, and vice reversibly engaged or remitted diabetes uh, back and forth solely dependent upon whether food was or was not going through the proximal intestine with a fixed and unchanging distal intestinal shortcut. Cheered up by that, that study, which in my opinion is the only direct evidence that proximal intestinal inclusion, sorry, nutrient exclusion renders anti-diabetic effects. Uh, cheered up uh, or encouraged by that, I've uh, now achieved funding along with David Flum uh, from the NIH to do the following study in humans to see whether this physiology applies in them and what its mechanisms are. This is a new R01 we have. The proposal is to take severely obese type 2 diabetic patients, study them very intensively with fre frequently sampled IV glucose tolerance tests for insulin secretion, hyperinsulinemic clamps with isotopic tracers for insulin sen sensitivity, as well as meal tolerance tests. They'll have these at the baseline, and we presume they will have bad glycemic parameters. They'll then undergo a gastric bypass and be fed in the normal way for the first two weeks, and we expect when these procedures are then repeated at two weeks, they will have great improvement in their glycemic parameters because we know clinically there's a lot of improvement by that time, and we'll get insights into whether this is primarily from insulin secretion, sensitivity, or both, and what, tens what targets the sensitivity might apply to. The key part of the study is then the next two weeks, Patients will be refed through a G-tube for two weeks uh, every, every meal of their, of their lives, 60% of the food going through the G-tube. And the prediction is that this reintroduction of, introduction of nutrients into the proximal intestine will erase the beneficial hyperdysemic uh, effects of the gastric bypass. Then to control for passage of time, we'll take the G-tube out and do another set of studies at the end of the period with the gastric bypass restored to its normal state and hopefully number two and number four will resemble each other. I don't have time to do justice to this hypothesis, but simply to mention that newer papers in very high profile journals have implicated the, the gut as not only a regulator of insulin secretion through its known effect on incretins, but also as an effector of insulin sensitivity in the liver through neural circuits. And these are nutrient sensing uh, pathways in the gut that regulate insulin sensitivity. This leads to the possibility that some of the early effects of gastric bypass, which reroutes nutrients through the gut, could be by changing these nutrient sensing pathways and altering insulin sensitivity, data that would be very interesting to try to generate in the future. So to summarize the potential candidates for weight independent anti-diabetic mechanisms after gastric bypass, increases in GLP-1 are a favorite along with other L-cell products that might help reduce weight. Reductions in ghrelin probably help. I think there's something very interesting going on in the duodenum, and then because of the shortness of time, I haven't mentioned a num number of other interesting hypotheses, all of which make this a very rich and fertile territory for research. I've tried to thank my collaborators and people who've shared their data with me along the way, but in case I forgot anyone, here's a long list, and I thank you all for your good attention.